in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Come on and lift your hands and just begin to give thanks for the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We honor you. We acknowledge you tonight, Father. God, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, somebody begin to pray with me as we invite the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit into this room. Father, we thank you that your will is being done in our lives. We thank you that your will is being done in our families. We thank you that your will is being done, Father God, in this church and in this ministry, God. And we declare, Father God, not our will, but your will be done. Father, I thank you, God, that we send up our praise. Come on and just begin to send up your praise. Begin to just acknowledge that he is great and mighty and powerful. We acknowledge you, Father. You are the giver of life. You're the giver of strength. You're the giver of hope. And we worship you. We bless you tonight. And we glorify your name. And we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be magnified. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. If this was your last moment on the earth, how would you exalt him? How would you bless him? How would you just love him? What would you say? What would you say? What would you say? You're my everything. You're my love. You're, you're the lover of my soul. You're the answer. You're, you're, you're the light in every bit of darkness that tries to come in my life. Thank you for raising me up. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving me a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. And you declare that I will be satisfied. I bless you right now. We honor you and we love you. And we thank you that you got up out of that grave. We thank you that you got up out of that grave. We thank you that you got up with all power in your hand. We thank you that because you rose again, you were able to go to the Father and he was able to release to us the promise of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Begin to thank him for his Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the Comforter. Thank you for the Comforter. Thank you for the Spirit of Truth. Thank you for the Spirit of Might. Thank you for the Spirit of Power. Thank you for the spirit of wisdom. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that Holy Spirit that allows, allows the fruit of the Spirit to become, come forth in us. God, thank you that you produce in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, uh, long-suffering, self-control. Father, I, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you for the gifts of the Spirit, the gift of prophecy, the gift of knowledge. We thank you for all of the gifts. We thank you for the fruit. We thank you that because of your Holy Spirit, we're able to remove the sinful nature and we're able to receive the divine nature of God. So we don't have to be confused. We don't have to be depressed. We don't have to be going left and right. We don't have to be unstable in all of our ways. We don't have to be children on milk, but we're able to mature because through the Holy Spirit, we receive Christ. We receive God. We receive the person we receive the Spirit of God within us. And we're thankful tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you hug someone before you take your seats? I welcome you tonight. I welcome you tonight. Glory to God. I'm alive because you're alive. Can bring up the lights of the sanctuary. I want to get into the word tonight. If you have a notebook, I encourage you to pull that notebook out. If you have notes on your phone, I encourage you to pull that out as well because we're going to study a little bit tonight. Last week we were talking about, and if you haven't noticed, the Holy Spirit, the Father, has taken us back into it. For those of you that are on the sides, if you could please come into the uh, center section, please. Uh, because I'm going to put up a slide in a minute that I need you to see so that you can understand where we're going tonight. The same thing with, with, with my spiritual father that is coming on the 21st. Hallelujah. Um, it's interesting how, the, how 
Papa, who's coming on the 21st, has been Periscope Pi. Let's, let's welcome everybody that's watching us online. Welcome. Thank you for being with us here tonight. Grab your Bible, grab your notebook. I want you to be able to understand. Um, one of the greatest deceptions of the enemy is the confusion in the body of Christ regarding the gifts of the Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and the connection that, that baptism and that indwelling of God through the Holy Spirit and through the baptism of the Holy Spirit affects us as believers. And so the enemy has been very, very busy throughout the ages bringing division in the body of Christ. Is it, is it necessary? Is it not necessary? Do we need to pray in the Spirit? Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit important? Is it necessary? Um, last week we had what I thought was an awesome time of teaching and in the Word and an awesome time of prayer where different individuals that are part of our congregation um, began to be, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to encourage those of you that were filled with the Holy Spirit, as I said on Sunday, help me Holy Spirit, to continue. It's, it's, it's something that you want to, it's a treasure and it's a gift, and you don't want to just hit it one time and quit it. You want to be able to, every time you go into your place of prayer, and I'm, I'm really going to encourage us to stop having drive-by prayers. Let's stop having drive-by prayer time, okay? What is drive-by prayer time? As you're rushing out the door, Father, I love you, I thank you, I bless you, I pray, I pray that you be with me today, no accidents, uh, no sickness, no broken bones, in the name of Jesus, and we're running out the door. If we want to go into the deeper things of God, if we want to know God, if we want the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us, if we want to really begin to tap into the gifts of the Spirit that God has designed and designated for every believer according to His will, you've got to spend time. Somebody say time. See, if, if I'm in a relationship and I'm married and I, I only get to talk to my husband when we're in passing, then our relationship is not going to be very strong. There has to be what? Time. There has to be conversation. There has to be being together. There has to be the, the exposing of each other's hearts to each other. So people are always changing. People are always growing. Corey's not the same person that he was when we got married. He's better today than he's ever been. But I won't know who he is. I won't know the essence of this person that I'm married to. Just because we're married doesn't mean that I know him every day because every day he's changing. Every day he's developing. Every day he's becoming a new person. Every day he's developing and growing into the person that God wants him to be because he has a heart after God. And so if I don't spend time, I can begin to try to treat him in a certain way based on who he used to be, not based on who he is now. Okay? It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. You have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or you're in the process of seeking that wonderful baptism. And if you have yet to have that experience, don't give up. Somebody say, don't give up. It's a promise that has been uh, given to you. And if we learn how to go back to, sometimes you got to go back to the old way. There's nothing wrong with tearing. And when I say tearing for the Holy Spirit is to where you get in the face of God and you continue to press into the presence of God, believing God for that experience. But if we never spend time with God, as soon as God is getting ready to pour his spirit out on you, you jump up and you move on to the next thing. That's one of the reasons why here at Rainfire Church, I believe that the Holy Spirit has allowed us to build an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit feels welcome. Where he knows that if I really pour myself out and I really begin to work on the hearts of the people and if I really begin to work in the lives of people, uh, Pastor Joanne, Pastor Corey, the ministers of the house are not going to cut me off. They're going to allow me to do what I'm supposed to do because I'm the head of this church. And he knows that. And we tell him that. And we invite him. How sad it is for churches that say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we invite you. In five minutes as he's trying to walk in through the door, they cut him off. Try having a conversation with somebody. And as soon as you start talking, they cut you off. Every time you begin to talk, you don't stop talking. There are many places where the Holy Spirit has stopped talking. Because he's not honored. And he's not respected because we don't spend time in the place of prayer and in that seeking, getting to know his voice. Because if a pastor doesn't know the voice of the Holy Spirit and doesn't know the presence of the Holy Spirit, then it's very easy to miss the Holy Spirit. If you don't know him, you won't recognize that he's walked in the room. If, you, if, if his presence never comes into your prayer closet, 
before you get on the stage with your big fancy sermon, if his presence never visits you in the prayer. See, when I answer the phone and my husband says, hey, babe, he doesn't have to say it's Corey Condry. I know his voice. Because I spend time with him. He's my husband. We're in a relationship. He doesn't have to say it's Corey. So the goal is Joanne, Jonathan, Brian, Nicole, Fundisha. The goal is spend enough time with him that you know his presence, that you know his moods, that you know how he's feeling, that you know his voice, that you begin to know the difference between the voice of the enemy, the voice of your heart, and the voice of God. Because there's a difference. Sometimes we're saying, God said, and what you're saying is the voice of your heart. It's not what God is saying. It's what you're saying. You're thinking you're discerning, but you're just being suspicious. That's not, God hasn't said it. It's your heart. It's your experience of speaking. Well, I just, I just don't feel peace. I just feel like the Lord said, is it the Lord or is it you? See, but you're not going to know the difference between those voices if you don't spend time hearing that voice, something that I pray all the time. Holy Spirit, tune my ears to your voice. Make my, make my ears sensitive to your voice. And sometimes I'm going to get it right and sometimes I'm going to miss it. But I'm not going to become frustrated and give up when I miss it. I'm going to keep seeking. It's like somebody that's learning a new language. You may mispronounce uh, del deronomio. When you start learning Spanish, that's how you say Deuteronomy in Spanish, Deuteronomio. You may mispronounce it the first 20 times, 50 times, 100 times, but does that mean you give up learning the language? No, you keep at it and you keep at it until you master it. The things of the Spirit, we have to keep at them and keep at them and keep at them. Not necessarily to master them, but to become knowledgeable, to have an understanding, to become comfortable in that place of flow. To know when he's leading you to speak to somebody. To know when he's saying, sing these songs for worship. To know when he's saying, speak on this tonight. As opposed to your schedule. Sometimes if he doesn't speak to you, you can stick to your schedule. But when he speaks, have an ear to hear. Like I say all the time about Abraham. He put up that night to sacrifice Isaac. Sacrifice Isaac because that's what God said. But what if he didn't have an ear to hear what God was saying at that moment? He had to be able to hear God say, sacrifice your son. But he also had to have an open ear to hear, Abraham, stop. Because we have to be where God is, not where God was. We have to be where he is every day. Father, in the name of Jesus, teach us to be where you are and not where you were. Because where you are means rhema. Where you are means revelation. Where you are means on time word. Where you are means on time instruction. Where you were sometimes means religion and traditions. But where you are means freshness of life in the spirit. God, I thank you. And so even as I've been, it's funny because we went into teaching on the Holy Spirit just because that's what I felt in my spirit was needed after we had been two weeks uh, talking about being a witness. And, and it was just like common sense, Joanne. If you talk about being an evangelist and being a witness and winning people to Jesus, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. So being a witness and being full of the power of the Spirit go hand in hand. Because you need to, when you go out and you're being a witness, you want to be able to have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. But not just the power. Somebody say, not just the power. It's not just speaking and praying in tongues, even though that's a part of it. It's not just getting the power, even though the power is a part of it. It is about God, through the Holy Spirit, coming on the inside of you. Beyond, see, we're saved by faith. Okay? You, you make a decision and you say, I, I need Jesus in my life. And the Holy Spirit is nagging at you and saying, you need to be born again. You need to be born again. You need to be born again, right? And you receive him, and we receive Jesus Christ by faith. We receive salvation by faith, but you can't just stay there. That's why you keep pressing forward and growing in your relationship with God. And now you begin to reach and desire the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to make sure that your spirit, your soul, your mind, and your body now is all aligned 
with God and with his will. So that includes sanctification. That includes the breaking of bad habits. That includes deliverance. That includes a, a clear mind to the will of God. That includes understanding the mysteries of God. Because now when you are just diving into that baptism of the Holy Spirit, Christ, God, the Father is coming on the inside of you. And now you can say, Holy Spirit, possess me. See, because you don't want your spirit to be saved, but your body is so sinful and so backslidden that what? That you end up losing your salvation because you continue to give yourself over to a sinful lifestyle to the point where sin separates you so far from God that it's just you've gone too far. So that desiring of more of him, that desiring, and that's why when you have that initial experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's so important to say, I'm going to pray in the Spirit and spend time with God as much as possible. Because when you, when that language first begins to bubble up in you, you're literally just scratching the surface of what it is that the Holy Spirit wants to manifest in your inner man. In your divine nature, in the new creation that's on the inside of you, okay? So I want to explain a few things because there may be some confusion and I want there to be understanding. If you could put the slide up for me. And let's take a look at this very quickly. And for those of you that are on Periscope, hopefully you can see this clearly. I'm alive because you're alive. Okay. So here, in Ephesians 4, 8, it says, he ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. So it's talking about Jesus, and it's talking about, here in the word of God, it's talking about the fact that he, he took uh, Satan captive, he took demons captive. He, he went down into the grave, he went down to the belly of hell itself. In order for, for us to be released, for us to be delivered, he, he conquered hell, death, and the grave, right? And he came up with all power in his hand. And because he was able to do this, now we're saying, and he gave gifts unto men. He gave gifts unto men. So these are the gifts of the Spirit. These are the gifts of God. These are the gifts that he places in people, all right? So if you look here, where it says 1 Corinthians twelve twenty eight. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And this diagram kind of divides this into two areas. Okay? So, you have 1 Corinthians 12, 28 that talks about the apostles, the prophets, the teacher, miracles, the gifts of healing. Okay? And we're going to go into um, the scripture because there it's talking a little bit more about the gifts and how to, how to administer the gifts. Okay? But then right here in the middle... As you can see, it says, so you have the eight operations of God, and you have three categories of gifts for the purpose of what? The purpose of the apostle, the teacher, the prophet, and even in how it says in Ephesians 4, 11, it says apostle, prophet, the teacher, the evangelist, and the pastor. So imagine it like this. Jesus, after his resurrection, goes up to heaven, and he started grabbing gifts. And he comes back down and he begins to, to release gifts to the body of Christ. And so within those gifts that he releases to the body, he releases gifts unto men, including apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and pastor. What is that for? It is not for us to be worshipped. It's not for us to be adored. It's not for us to be catered to. Even though if God places it on your heart to serve somebody that is in spiritual authority over you, that's fine. That is biblical. But it's not that we're supposed to think that we're better than anybody else. Because this is just, this is just a job description. It's a job description that God gives you the anointing to fulfill. Okay? But what is the purpose of these five administrations or these five offices? It's for the purpose of what? The perfecting of the saints. Okay? For what? The work of the ministry. So the three categories of gifts is the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry. So the, the fivefold ministry brings to you the word that you're supposed to take and apply it to your life. 
So I have to teach you about healing. I got to teach you about faith. I got to teach you about deliverance. I got to teach you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you don't have faith to believe for these things, then you don't ever put a demand on these things from God. If nobody ever preaches, how can they, how can people be saved if there is no one preaching the gospel? That's why he said go into all the world and preach the gospel because it's in the hearing of the gospel being preached that the Holy Spirit is able to touch the hearts of men and give them the faith to believe that if they confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, they will be saved. So the fivefold ministry has to teach the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say under the anointing. If all you're doing is bringing head knowledge and all you're doing is bringing doctrine and theology, nobody's going to change. They're just going to walk out and say, wow, that was deep, that was nice, but there will not be a transformation. The word of God comes forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. It can be a scripture that you've heard a million times, but because the Holy Spirit has breathed on it, suddenly your spirit begins to leap and your spirit says, yes, that's what I need. And it comes alive in you and now you're convinced to go after that thing. So that's the job of the five-fold ministry. So five-fold ministry, if you're not spending time, and if you're not spending uh, that quality time in prayer and praying in the spirit, then you're just going through the motions because you're not ministering life. Okay? It's only the life of the spirit that then brings to what? The purpose of the perfecting of the saints. So if you come here week after week, but you never take what you hear and put it into practice, you will not be perfected. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's the reason why the gifts, these five gifts, were given. The perfecting of the saints. Okay? But then over here, in the eight operations of God, where it says apostle, prophet, teacher, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, and government. See, if, you don't, if you're not in the five-fold ministry, then you're probably going to fall into one of these categories, helps and governments. What is it? Administration, helps, deacons, ushers, outreach, feeding, uh, clothing the poor, um, any type of administrative work, um, worship ministries, all of those things. Because the, the fivefold ministry can be uh, in effect and they can be working, but it's not enough for there to be a healthy body. Somebody say a healthy body. We want to have a healthy body and that's why everybody within the body needs to find their place. You have to spend time with God to say, God, what is my place? Is your place the place of intercession? Is your place the place of serving? Is your place uh, the place of welcoming people? Is your place in administration? Is your place working and teaching the children? See, that falls under teachers. Because now we're talking about gifts. So we have gifts. We have the fivefold ministry. We have helps and government. And so the fivefold ministry exists for the purpose of perfecting the saints, teaching you, getting to you the revealed word of God. But then what do you have? Helps and government, people that fall into that category, what is their purpose? The work of the ministry. This is the reason why the apostle said we can't keep uh, waiting on tables. We can't keep taking care of the orphan. We can't keep taking care of the widows because if we don't spend time with God, then we're not going to be able to fulfill our first purpose, which is the purpose of perfecting the saints. So as the fivefold ministry spends time with God and they pour into you the word of God, you're supposed to be perfected in your spirit, in your life, in your body, in your mindset, in your gifts, in your actions, in your attitude, because you're taking that word. And you're working that word. And you're praying that word. And you're interceding that word. And you're hungry for that word. And that word is coming alive within you. And that word and relationship with the Holy Spirit is bringing changes into you that brings you to perfection. In Christ, nobody's perfect. We can be perfect in Christ. We can push toward perfection. That doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake, but it's one thing to make a mistake. It's another thing to live making mistakes over and over again and choosing not to learn from your mistakes. A perfect believer is one that is, what, like David, quick to repent. Right? Helps and governments for the purpose of the work of the ministry. The people that work and feed. The people that are in the worship team. They're, you're doing the work of the ministry. Those that go out and evangelize. Those that will talk to people. 
those that will invite people to church, those that will be over small groups, all of those things. We're doing the work of the ministry. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, as you continue reading, and it talks about the last thing that it mentions is diversities of tongues. Somebody say diversities of tongues. What does that mean? That means that there isn't just one type of tongue. Diversities, diversity, that means that there's different types. There are people that will go to the scripture and they'll say, no, praying in tongues is only for prophecy. If there isn't prophecy, then you shouldn't pray in tongues. That's not what the word of God is saying. You have to be able to take everything into context. And so when it talks about diversities of tongues, you have what? Tongues for interpretation. That's through prophecy. Look at this. Tongues as a sign to the unbeliever. This is all biblical. Tongues are a sign to the unbeliever. Remember in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in other languages, not just in robo shoko, robo sanda, but they came out and they're Jewish and they were saying, El Espíritu de Dios está aquí y la gloria de Dios está manifestando. Y usted necesita recibir a Jesús como su Salvador. They were speaking in languages that people from those native lands could understand and it was a sign to them that the power of God is real. Do you know that that still happens today? But because we don't know that, we don't believe for that. We don't say, Holy Spirit, fill me in every area. Do whatever it is. That, how amazing would it be for you to go out witnessing and suddenly the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you walk up to a Hispanic woman and you begin to speak and what comes out is Spanish. And she says, oh my God, how do you know my language? And you say, because Jesus is Lord. And he died and he rose again. Will she be open to salvation? Will she be open to hear more about this Jesus that can take somebody that does not even understand the language and enable them to speak a language that they don't know? That's impossible. But go and study the, the revival of Azusa. And the woman who became William Seymour's wife. And the spirit came upon her and she went by the lady of the spirit and sat down at the piano and began to play when she'd never taken a lesson. We got to take God out of the box, guys. We got to take him out of the box. We got to get to that place where we're willing to say, you know what, God, whatever it is that you say, however it is that you want to manifest, however it is that you want to move in my life, I receive it. But why is it that we have to spend time in prayer and praying in the spirit? Because the more we pray, the more our spirit expands and the more we're able to open up on the inside to receive the capacity of God. If your spiritual space is tied up with inferior uh, issues and drama and gossip and fear and doubt and unbelief, where does God fit in all that? See, we can't do a drive-by prayer time and then think, oh my God, my spirit is just going to be so wide to receive everything that God has. No, he's, it's going to take a minute. It's like a shoe. If it's tight, it's tight. But then you get a shoe stretcher and what? You put it in there and you begin to crank that baby. And then the shoe stretcher begins to open up, right? And you can't just take it out right away. You got to let that stretcher sit in that shoe for a good 24 hours. You may even have to wet the shoe. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You may have to wet the shoe in order for the leather to stretch. Let me tell you, some of us have some old religious leather. Some of us have some old, old way of thinking leather. Some of us are made of some old wine skins. But I declare that God is getting ready to pour his spirit out on us. And we're going to stop being old wine skins. And he's going to turn us into some new wine skins. And we're going to have new faith, new expectation, new power, new glory, new wisdom. Everything that God has for us. Because he said he's not going to pour new wine into old wineskins. I refuse to be an old wineskin. Somebody say, I refuse to be an old wineskin. The next diversity of tongues. Tongues for deep intercessional groanings. Intercession. You may groan. You may moan because now your tongues and your prayer. You're praying. You don't know what you're praying. But the intercession is not even for you. It's for somebody else. Intercession, you're standing in the gap for somebody else. And then four is what we experienced last Tuesday. When you came up to be prayed and to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because the word of God says that you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. Tongues for personal edification, which means you can pray in the spirit in tongues anytime on purpose just because you want to. You see what I'm saying? 
I'm not going to come into the church. You can go down because I'm about to go to my notes. I'm not going to come into the church and begin to just pray in the spirit for an hour while you sit and listen to me. Because when I pray in the spirit, I'm building up myself, my holy faith. I'm building up my internal capacity to carry God. But when we're within the body, and we'll go into the word of God so that you can hear specifically what the apostle said himself and not just the word of Joanne. And I felt like this was important because I want us to understand how all of these things work together. And especially when you see that the diversity of tongues is the last thing that was mentioned in that passage. Why? Because it, it's at the bottom. I believe that diversities of tongues is the foundation. It's the foundation that allows you to know when God is pushing you into helps, when God is pushing you into government, when God is calling you into the fivefold ministry. He can call you into the fivefold ministry, but it's the diversity of tongues. What is the purpose of it? The edifying of the body. What is it to edify? To build up. To build up. So if you never edify yourself, you can be called to be a prophet, but because you never spend time in the diversity of tongues, in the diversity of gifts of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit, if you never put in that time, you can have the calling, but you won't have the gifts to go with that calling. And sometimes we try to step out because we say, well, I'm, I know I'm called to be a pastor, I know I'm called, and we try to jump out there and do what we know what we're called to do, but we're ill-equipped. Somebody say ill-equipped. Let's go to the Word. It's 7.52. I'm doing good on time. All right? 1 Corinthians 14 says this. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. Eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. So the gifts of the Spirit is not just for the five-fold ministry that you see in the middle. The gifts of the Spirit are for everyone within the body. For anyone, look at this, who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. I love this scripture. Because one of the things that I love more than anything is spending time praying in the Spirit. And I see it like this. When I pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is taking a USB and he is plugging it into God. And he's downloading into that USB drive the secrets and the mysteries and the revelations and the gifts and the power and the nature of God that God has designated for me in this season. And when I spend time praying in the spirit, I'm getting excited. And I'm in that place of prayer and I'm spending time with God. The Holy Spirit goes and removes that USB from the Father and comes down and plugs it into Joanne. And when he plugs it into Joanne, immediately I click on that USB file. And it could be something this small that you're plugging into your computer, but it can download into your computer a 5,000 page document. And let me tell you, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a limit of what he can download into you. The question is, is your computer ready? Do you have enough memory? Is your hard drive clean? Oh my God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. See, I don't think about these things. It's all him. See, I'm trying to get my hard drive ready. I'm trying to make sure there's no viruses on the inside of me that are going to corrupt, oh my God, the file that God is trying to download into me. Because if he's called me to have a prophetic mantle on my life, pride cannot get in the way. Pride will corrupt that prophetic anointing. Greed will pro co corrupt that prophetic anointing. So God is saying, uh-uh, Joanne. And let me tell you, the danger is, is that some people keep pushing to be who they know they're called to be without going through this process. And then they get to their destination, but they get there with so much mess that it explodes on them. And suddenly, the scandals, and suddenly, why? Because there were things that were hidden in the hard drive that the Holy Spirit was trying to clean out and wipe out and nobody paid attention. Because I'm a big, I'm big time now. I, I'm, I'm in the big, I'm in the big stadiums. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm popular. I got five million followers on, on, on Twitter and on Instagram. I, you know, I, I am a millionaire. Just because you got millions and just because you got five million followers does not mean that you don't have, need to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to you, Archbishop, Apostle, Prophet, Deacon, Pastor, Usher, whoever you may be. None of us are exempt from needing to have that fresh download. And let me tell you, you want to stay connected because the file that you got yesterday was for yesterday's assignment. You don't want to go into tomorrow.
tomorrow with yesterday's assignment. You don't want to go into tomorrow with yesterday's gifts. You don't want to go into tomorrow with yesterday's anointing. What would happen to the manna if they kept it longer than they needed to keep it? He said, only take what you need for that day. And people thought they were slick and they were trying to save it. And the next thing they went, the next morning, and when it was full of worms, that old anointing, you're trying to preach with that old anointing. You ain't been dipped in the spirit since 1972 and you still trying to preach that same message. And you're wondering why it is that people don't feel life when you speak to them. And they're falling asleep because there's no power, there's no freshness, there's no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something, this Bible may be 2,000 years old or however old it is, but when the spirit breathes on it, the one that wrote it breathes on it. When the one that wrote it breathes on it, how can he breathe on it? The only way that he can breathe on it if the one that is uttering that word has been with him so he can breathe on you first. Some of us don't just need him to breathe, we need him to blow. Because <sighs> we gotta get that dust off and we gotta, like, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about it. No one under, do not speak, when you speak in tongues, when you pray in, in tongues, no one understands you but God. So when something feels like it's not right, when your stomach don't feel right, pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. When my husband had the accident, when my husband had the accident, that morning, my parents were in Medellin, Colombia, and my father asked my mother to leave with the pastors, and, and he stayed in the hotel room by, him, by himself. And when he tells me the story afterwards, he said, Joanne, I felt like I was gonna die. He said, I felt like I was gonna die, and I didn't know what it was. He said, but I began to pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit, pray in the spirit. He said, I didn't know what was wrong, but I began to pray in the spirit. I didn't know what was happening, but I felt literally like my life was coming to an end. And I began to pray in the spirit and pray in the spirit. And he said, around 1.30, it lifted. And it was around 2 o'clock that Corey had the accident. Is it by chance? Is it by chance? Maybe there were other people that God was touching their hearts at that very moment to intercede and to pray, and they just didn't even know why they were praying. But those prayers were going into the spiritual world. Those prayers were activating the angels. Those prayers were sending angelic ministers right to the, the intersection of, of uh, Post Road and, and Mason Creek Road or whatever that road is, uh, Ephesus Church and, and Post Road. And those angels were on standby. And they only allowed what needed to happen to happen. And they were there keeping Corey's heart pumping. Keeping him uh, aware and awake. Keeping him alive. And they were holding his spirit down in his body. You ain't going nowhere, son. You got a work to do. So between Corey's faith and the ministering angels, see, we're so carnal and we're so attached to this earth that we don't even know what's going on around us. There's a warfare that is going on around us. But when you learn how to be a prayer warrior, when you learn how to pray in the spirit, when you learn to intercede, when you learn to pray the mysteries of God, God can have you praying for a, a missionary in China that's getting ready to be killed, but you begin to intercede for them and somehow God makes a way out of no way for them to escape. You don't know? Because when we pray in the spirit, we're praying the mysteries of God. When we pray in the spirit, the devil himself cannot stop the agenda that God is unfolding through your prayer in tongues. So as you pray in the spirit, God begins to move according to his will. And the devil doesn't even, oh my God, I gotta take this off. And the devil doesn't even know what's being said. The devil, and he's like, wait, 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 wait. Angels are moving. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Wait, wait. And he's nervous and he sees angels moving and he sees doors beginning to open. But because he can't understand, he can't block it. Because he can't understand, he cannot perceive what the next step is going to be in order to stop it. Have you ever noticed that there have been a plan or something that you spoke to somebody about? I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do that and I'm going to go do this. And then when you go to do it, you get blocked every step of the way. Maybe we should stop talking so much. In a, in a language that he can understand. And maybe we need to spend some more time praying in the spirit. So that the mysteries of God and the purpose of God and the will of God 
can be literally manifested in our lives in a way that he cannot even block it because he has no idea what is being said. Verse three, look at this. And now he's talking to the Corinthian church. See, they had, they had been introduced to the gifts of the spirit. They were receiving the gifts of the spirit and they were excited. And they were coming in just like this and they were coming in to have a worship service and all of a sudden everybody, everybody, I, I'm, I, the person is trying to teach the word and all of a sudden everybody's no, 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 I hear the spirit of the Lord say, and there was chaos everywhere because everybody was excited, everybody was on fire, everybody was filled with the spirit, everybody was prophesying, everybody was just overflowing in the gifts and so Paul had to say, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's wonderful that y'all are full and on fire. But y'all look at some like some nuts right now. Right? We need to bring this into order. Because God is not crazy. God is not disorderly. There can be excitement. There can be joy. There can be celebration. There can be praying in the spirit. There can be a moment where I say to you, come on, let's all pray in the spirit. That is a moment where we're all together praying in the spirit. It's not necessary for there to be prophecy at that moment because we're all praying in the spirit together. But he had to bring clarity and understanding also for us to be able to understand. Look at this. So when anyone speaks, they speak um, to God, not to people. And no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the spirit. Okay? Verse 3. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Okay? So he's trying to say when we come together, if you're going to pray in the spirit, make sure that there's somebody else in the room that has the gift of interpretation. So that you can pray in the spirit and the person with the gift of interpretation can by the spirit interpret what has been prayed or uttered in the spirit so that everyone in the room can benefit because when you're praying in the spirit the only one that benefits is you but when the interpretation comes forth everybody is able to receive and somebody says and that person stands up and they're overwhelmed and they begin to pray in the spirit and then as that person dies down somebody says thus saith the Lord I hear the spirit of the Lord saying there is a time that is coming for rejoicing because of this and this and that whatever, whatever. but all of these things are the gifts of the spirit that we and maybe in this modern day and time we don't spend enough time even talking about it and people don't know about it so they don't even realize, wait a minute, I'm saved and I, I could possibly have the gift to interpret tongues. I'm saved and I could possibly have the gift of prophecy to edify the church. What, you mean I'm saved and I could possibly have uh, the gift of healing and, and, and the working of miracles? It, it, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so we're shortchanging the body. We're not allowing the body to develop. So we have an underdeveloped church that has no infilling of God through the Holy Spirit, has no gifts of the Spirit, is barely bearing the fruit of the Spirit, and then you wonder why we're so busy trying to become like the world. You understand? Because we don't understand who we are. We don't understand that we've been set apart. Okay? And look at this. But the one who prophesies, speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Verse 4, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, which is great. But, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So each thing has its moment. When you have your personal prayer time, you don't have to worry about interpreting. You can pray in the spirit all day long and edify your spirit and strengthen your spirit. And then when we come together, it's wonderful for there to be prayer in the spirit and interpretation so the body can be edified. So that we can all be built up. Okay? And now, brothers and sisters, verse 6. If I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you? Here he's giving the example. Unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there's a distinction in the notes? Again, if that trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, verse 9. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then, so he's saying to you, you're not just babbling. 
Praying in the Spirit, when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, is a heavenly language. Which means that there is interpretation, there is meaning to that language. Okay? That language is communicated when you're full of the Spirit and you're praying in the Spirit. You have that direct connection that bypasses your brain and goes from your spirit to the Spirit of God. That's why I gave the USB analogy. Or you can also use the broadband connection analogy where that wire or that Wi-Fi is the Holy Spirit. But you have God and you have us. And your mind doesn't have even a chance to doubt because what the Holy Spirit is saying through your praying in the Spirit doesn't even have the opportunity to bring doubt in your mind because your brain, your natural brain doesn't understand. So if you can't get in the way, the devil can't get in the way, and God can do what he wants to do. Make sense? So he's saying that it's a language. So what shall I do? Okay? Verse 13, let me back up. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. That means within the congregation. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. That doesn't mean your spirit is unfruitful. He's saying your mind is unfruitful because you don't know what you're praying. But your spirit, they've already told us that it builds you up. It edifies you to pray in the spirit. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my spirit. That means I will pray in my heavenly language. I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing. Come on, worship leaders. I will sing with my spirit. We can sing in the spirit and receive the, the interpretation of that prophetic song that was released in the spirit to English or Spanish or whatever language. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you're praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now uh, put in the position of an inquirer say amen? How can they say amen if, you, if they don't know what you're saying? How can they say amen to your thanksgiving since they do not know what you're saying? You're giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. He's teaching us how to govern the service. Okay? But I thank God, look at this, that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. I don't know. But is it possible? Is it possible that there's a connection with Paul's prayer life in the spirit and the fact that he wrote more of the New Testament than any other apostle? See, he wasn't familiar with Jesus in the flesh. So he had an extra hunger after he had his experience on the road of Damascus and how after he spent, I don't know, it was between 12 and 15 years or something like that, training with the apostles. But then there came, there came a separation because there was, because of his, his praying in the spirit, because he, he was so, he said, I pray in the spirit more than all of you. The Holy Spirit was revealing things to him that the spirit, that the spirit was not revealing to the other apostles because of his life of praying in the spirit. That's why I keep telling the worship leaders and those that are part of the worship team, don't get up here without praying in the Spirit at least an hour. And if you're not filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, seek it until you find it. Seek Him, excuse me, Holy Spirit. Seek Him until He fills you. As we sing, till we overflow. I want to run over. Okay? Why? Because when you are praying in the Spirit, He can reveal to you His plan for the service. He can reveal to you the songs that he wants you to sing. He can reveal to your spirit the revelation of what it is that he wants you to minister in between the songs. Pastor, when you pray in the spirit, he can reveal to you a scripture and, and show it to you in a way that you've never seen it before. And it's not necessarily for you to say, oh, I'm going to say this so I can make a, a book that I'm going to sell and this is going to become a bestseller and I'm going to sell. Everything does not have to be about our personal gain. Actually, nothing. None of this should be for our personal gain. It should be for the edification of the body. It should be for the edification of the body. For the body. God gives it to you for the body. Father, I thank you. Let me find where I was. Okay, 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church. See, there's the context. But in the church. 
I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he's saying, listen, when I am in my prayer closet, I'm going to pray in the spirit for six hours so that then when I come to you, I don't need to pray in the spirit when I come to you because I'm already built up. I'm already powered up. I'm already ready. And when I come, I don't need to pray in the spirit because I'm already built up. So I come and I can give you five words that are anointed and full of power and they're going to change your life and it's going to give you instruction. But in the church, I would rather speak to you five words to instruct you other than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, verse 21, with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Verse 22, here it goes back to our diagram. Tongues, then, are a sign. See, here's another Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? Verse 24, but if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everybody is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Why do we keep looking for new ways to do things? Isn't this beautiful? He's saying tongues is for the unbeliever. But when, when it's within the body, let there be interpretation. Let there be prophecy so that the secrets of the unbeliever's heart can be revealed. And when you tell them or say something that nobody could know. Yeah. Let me tell you, I was so impacted by the, a woman that came with Gwen in April. And I ended up at a, at a party, at a birthday party. Um, and she was, it was at her salon. And when Gwen brought her over to me, she said, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I just love you so much. She said, my life has been on fire since I left Rain Fire. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what she was talking about. She said, I came there in April. She said, you would never know what I've been through. I came to Atlanta with $200 in my pocket. I've been in jail. I've been homeless. I've been through this and I've been through that. I don't, I don't read well. I don't write well. I have been through hell and back. But there was a book that I had been trying to write. And, but, but there was something that was holding me back. I was afraid. And it was holding me back. It was holding me back. It was holding me back. And, and something kept telling me, how are you going to release a book when you don't even read well? How can you release a book when you don't even write well? You're, you don't even know how to express yourself and communicate. Because she's in the profession of doing hair. She said, I was always used to being in the background. I've worked with everybody. But, but reading and writing and communicating verbally was not necessary because my gift of doing hair made open doors for me. She said, but from the moment I was at Rainfire, you were getting ready to dismiss the service. And you stopped and you looked at me and you, and you pointed your finger at me and you began to speak to me. And she said, after service, I went to Gwen and I said, did you tell her about my life? And Gwen said to her, no, I haven't. I did not even remember I've never seen that woman a day in my life. I didn't know anything about her. I just know that I felt like the spirit was saying, speak and I in obedience, in obedience, through the power of the spirit, began to release prophetically what God was saying. And it, for her life, it hit, it just hit right on the nose. She said, from that day, she said, my book is out. I released the book. She said, just a few weeks after I released the book, I was in front of a room of 150 people speaking to them. And God was touching their hearts through my testimony and through my life. She said, but I know that I know that what happened was that God, the presence of God and the power of God touched my life and I left that place changed. See, that doesn't require good marketing. Not that there's anything wrong with good marketing. We need good marketing for the unbeliever. Okay? We need glossy pictures for the unbeliever. We need, you know, good lighting and all this kind of stuff because the unbeliever is attracted to what they see. But the believer, we should be attracted to the reality of the things of God. We should have the discernment to say, okay, everything's nice, everything's glossy. 
but God is not here, mm, yeah, I won't be here again. You understand what I'm saying? Because when God is in the midst, so that's what, that's what the enemy wants to remove from the church so that we don't have that power, okay? Chapter 15, I'm almost done. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Okay, verse 26, here we go. When then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone, here's the balance, speaks in a tongue, two or three at the most, should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Okay? Verse 29, two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy, look at this, you can all prophesy, in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Verse 32, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. So that means that when we're flowing in the gifts of the spirit, don't tell me, I just got so overwhelmed, I just couldn't control myself. And the person's trying to leave Bible study, and you standing up in the middle of Bible study, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord is speaking right up to them. <laughs> this is not the moment for that. One of the things that's important to learn in a, in a house and during a service, that if God gives you a word, go to the person that is in leadership of that, of that time of learning and growth and say, I believe that I have a word for the church. May I share it? May I speak it? And based on the witness of the Spirit, they'll either say yes or they'll say no. Either way, don't feel discouraged. I had other people before who have written down the prophetic word and given it to me and given me the opportunity to read it. I think that that is in order because it allows me as the pastor that is in, in the, the position of authority at that time to be able to judge whether this is something that needs to be released to the people right now or if it's something that we need to hold, okay? And so two or three of our prophets should speak, they should weigh, all right? Okay, the spirit, here we go, 32. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people, okay? But all of these things are made possible how? Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Through spending time with the Spirit. As you spend time with the Holy Spirit, He's going to begin to... See, the first time that I heard the word evangelist in my ear was during a time of fasting and prayer. Because I heard God say evangelist. Then later on, He spoke pastor. So I know that I'm a pastor, but I also have an evangelistic anointing. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you may begin when you are a new believer. You may begin in the area of helps. You may begin in the area of government. You may begin as an usher. You may begin as a teacher in Sunday school. You may begin in a certain area, serving in a certain capacity. But as you show faithfulness in that area, and as you continue to spend time with God, he begins to continue releasing to you the gifts. And as time moves on, he may be releasing to you the gift of the prophet. He may be releasing to you an apostolic anointing. He may be releasing to you a pastoral anointing. But those things are able to be released to you as you grow in maturity. And what is part of that growing in maturity is spending time with God, praying in the spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to download into you the gifts of the spirit that are for you and for your calling. And so we should be excited to go after God, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We should be excited to spend uninterrupted. Let me say that, uninterrupted. We should be excited to spend un uninterrupted time with the Lord. Uninterrupted. 
Put that phone on night mode. Turn it off even. Set aside. If you can only begin by setting aside 20 minutes, then set it aside. But really be focused. Really, really focused. Don't think about the laundry. Don't think about this. Don't think about that. Oh, I got to go do this. And we'll get up from the place of prayer to take the laundry out of the washing machine to put it in the dryer and then go back up here a little bit. And then it takes you a whole another 10 minutes to get back into the position of being able to hear God. You want to be able to be in a place where you cut out the distractions in a room maybe or a time that you're going to be by yourself. For some moms, that means that you may have to do it in the middle of the night. You may have to set your alarm for one in the morning and get up and go into the closet. You know what? If you fall asleep while you're in there, who cares? At least God is saying, there's hunger. I can work with that. Because you know that sleepy demon is this. The struggle is real. But you know what? As that hunger continues to grow in you, and I've spent the time talking about it because I want you, as he said in the beginning of chapter 14, eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. Eagerly desire to be filled. Eagerly desire to pray in the Spirit so that the mysteries of God can be revealed. Eagerly desire to spend that time in prayer in the Spirit so you can build up your most holy faith. Eagerly desire to prophesy so that you can build up the church. Eagerly desire all of the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Spirit, the anointings of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, so that we can all be what perfected and built up and edified. Amen? And I believe that when we begin to do that, there's going to be more flourishing in our lives that the world can look at and say, whoa. Why are people always going to fortune tellers? People will go to somebody and say, read my poem. I want to know my future. People live in anxiety and in worry. People live in fear. And they will go and they will pay money for somebody to tell them their future. And God is saying, will there be an end time church that will flow in the gift of prophecy, that will flow in the gifts of the spirit, that will flow in the gift of discernment, that will flow in the gift of working miracles, that will flow in the gift of faith, that will flow in the anointing of the fivefold ministry, that will flow in the teaching and the preaching of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because when you begin to flow in this power and you're able to walk up to somebody and say, I hear God saying, that you've been struggling in your marriage and you don't know the person from Adam and they begin to break down crying, are they going to come with you if you invite them to church? Are they going to, and is there more of a probability that they will receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Is there more of a possibility that because they have experienced something that just blew their mind that they will believe that Jesus is alive, that he's no longer dead? Maybe the lack of revival and the lack of conversions in the church from unbelievers is because the power of the spirit the person of the spirit is not among us and in us and working in us the way he should so instead we have people that jump from church to church as opposed to us bringing in the fish from the sea no but we taking the fish from Kroger over to Publix and we taking the fish from Publix over to Food Depot and we taking the fish on Food Depot back over. Instead of, and, and, and people are saying, there's a shortage of fish. Don't open up a church on my street. And it's just like, there's a shortage of fish because we keep going from store to store. But if we go to the sea, but the laborers are few. So we pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will equip us through the, lift your hands and just begin to ask him to equip you. Holy Spirit. Even for those of us that have prayed in the Spirit for years, and even for those that have recently received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Father God, that we would dive back into that well of spending time and praying in the Spirit so that we can be equipped for the work that is needed and necessary for this day and time. Father God, that we would be equipped, Father God. Father God, it seems like we're so much more equipped in other external uh, gifts and talents than equipped in the things of the Spirit. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that in the place of, of praying in the Spirit and having an ear to
to hear what the Spirit is saying, that prophecy coming alive and praying the Spirit and interpretation for the edifying of the church. God, that it would come alive again within the church so that the church can be built up. That prophecy and tongues for the unbelievable would be manifested, Father God, so that those that don't believe would experience something that is so mind-blowing that they'll say, God truly is among you. Revive us again, Lord. And bring us back into that, into that prayer closet. Bring us back into that place of fasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Look at me. Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Papa was ministering and he said, some of you may be asking, how much do I have to ask for the Spirit? He said, over my life of 72 years, he said, I've ordered chicken thousands and thousands and thousands of times. I've asked for chicken thousands of times over my lifetime. I ask for chicken when I'm hungry and I want to eat chicken. So with the things of the spirit, don't feel strange to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking. Ask when you need it. Ask when you don't need it. Ask, 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 ask. Because we think, okay, knock and the seek. Seek. Seek and you shall find. I think if we interpret that to the original, it, it, it'll say something like seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. We'd be like, Holy Spirit, oh, ain't nobody home. <laughs> what? You got to be determined. You have to say, I want to be edified. I want to be built up. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I need more of you. I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Every day I need more. Holy Spirit, fill me, fill me, fill me. Fill me till I overflow. Fill me. I can't get enough of you. And you know what? If you get up the next day with the same prayer, so be it. If you feel like you need him, then ask for more of him. Even if you don't feel like you need him, know that the moment is coming that you're going to need more of him. Ask for him. Because if we get desperate, just about every person that has had an extraordinary ministry, we read the books about the after, once the Holy Spirit reveals to them. But what did they have to do to get those gifts? What did they have to do for the power to be released? What was the process? How did they have to die to the flesh? How did they have to sanctify themselves? How much did they have to fast and pray? That's where we have to start. We all want the story. Oh, so and so raised five people from the dead. Okay, but what price do they have to pay in relationship with the Holy Spirit and in seeking God in order for that to be released? But maybe we're just a generation that is too lazy and too busy and we don't have time. But I declare in the name of Jesus that God is right now raising up a generation that will not be lazy, that will make the time, that will be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and the Holy Spirit will find a generation among us that can be entrusted with the person of who he is to then be able to manifest his gifts and his power, not for our glory, not for our fame, not for us to become rich, but for souls to be saved and for the body to be edified. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. Clap your hands to the Lord. Let's thank God for his word. I know I've never given you guys a diagram before, but there's a first time for everything. There's a first time for everything. Let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord in our giving.